Now, there are four New Testament passages we want to look at. The first is in Matthew's record, Matthew chapter 11. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 11. And as we read these words, just let me remind you that we're actually reading the words of the judge himself. This is the person who is going to be seated on that great white throne just here to the far right on the chart. And he is going to give us some knowledge ahead of time about that judgment. So notice his words in verse 20. Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, now Tyre and Sidon were notably evil cities, they were pagan cities, idolatrous worshipers, and yet the Lord Jesus is saying, if what he did in these cities had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee would have been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Now, the Gospel of John, please. And we're going to read in John chapter 5. <clears throat> John chapter 5. And verse 24. I know that everywhere that we read in God's word is important. But these 34 words are God's way of salvation, simply put by the, the Savior himself. So please notice them as we read them. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Chapter 12, please, of this same book. And verse 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the Lord Jesus is referring to Calvary, as we will see in a moment. Notice how he describes it. He describes it as a world judgment. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world, that is the devil, now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Now in my Bible, on the pages of my Bible, verse 48 is right across from this. Just look down, please, at verse 48. He that rejecteth me, and receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So in verse 31, now where we are in history, in the year that we live, the judgment of this world in verse 31 is past. That happened at Calvary. The judgment of verse 48 is future. And that's what we're going to read about further now in the book of Revelation, a day in the future when men and women will be judged. Final reading, please, in Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. If you were here last evening, you will remember that we read in verse 5, the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So now just as a, as a recap, please, notice with me that when we considered the rapture, the coming of the Lord Jesus for his people, that at that point, Christians will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Christians who have died will be resurrected. Christians who have not yet died will be given new bodies and caught up with him so that all who are saved in this period of time will be in heaven with the Lord Jesus. 
in glorified, resurrected bodies when all of these events are taking place. Where we read in Revelation 19, when the Lord Jesus comes back as the conqueror and comes back to set up his kingdom, he'll bring from heaven the Christians that are there, bring them with him because we're going to be part of his kingdom. And when he comes back to earth, he sets up his kingdom. We read that he gathers the survivors who are on earth before him on that valley on the east side of Jerusalem when he sets up his throne and that he separates them, sheep and goats, and that he tells the goats to go away and they go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous enter into his kingdom. Now they are people like you still in physical bodies. So the Christians will be in resurrected bodies and there's no uh, sense of marriage and family or begetting of children, but the people who are on earth when the Lord Jesus comes back and who are saved, they will go into this kingdom here on earth and they will have many, many children. But just please notice now that when the Lord Jesus comes back, the rest of the dead don't live until the thousand years, the millennium is over. Now, please keep that in mind as we continue to read. Look down at verse seven. And when the thousand years, that's the sixth time in this short passage that God has told us that the reign of Christ is a millennium. It's a thousand years. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Now, if you were here earlier in the meetings, we read about a huge attack by forces that were titled Gog and Magog that will take place in the middle of this seven-year period, and it is destroyed before it can reach Jerusalem and annihilate the nation of Israel. Now, a thousand years later, the same Godless rebellion is characterizing people so that the same term is used. But please notice, instead of it being people who are joined from nations, in, or at least a nation in the north, and a confederacy of just a handful of nations, now it's in the four quarters of the earth. Now they are more than can be numbered, more than the sand of the sea. So there are great lessons to be learned by this, but let's continue to read. Verse 9, they went up, this attacking, rebellious army, trying to crucify Christ again. They went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, Jerusalem. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall, and that's a plural, they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now you will remember that we read last night that at the beginning of the thousand years, the beast and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. One thousand years later, they are still there. And the devil is thrown in with them. So these two men have been in the lake of fire for a thousand years at this point, And the devil joins them. If it just ended there. It would not be so solemn. But now comes the human race. Verse 11. And I saw a great white throne. And him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead. Notice that? The dead. Because we read earlier the rest of the dead live not. At this point. Everybody who is saved is alive in a resurrected body. But the dead are those whose body, whose souls are in hell, bodies buried. Now, they are the rest of the dead. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now this is, of course, what people refer to when they talk about the end of the world and the day of judgment. 
It is the great white throne judgment of Revelation 20. And apart from the topic of salvation, I do not know another subject in our Bible about which the mists of confusion have so thickly gathered as this. Everything that has to do with the judgment has been confused in the minds of men. The time of it, the participants, the reason for it, the results, everything, everything has been confused. So what we need to do tonight is find out what does God say about this tremendous moment when the human race of unsaved men and women have to meet God. I want you to think, first of all, about the scene. Let's, let's look at the scene itself and we'll learn about the time. So even a, a quick reading of the passage that we read shows us that this great white throne judgment or the end of the world takes place at the end of the millennium as the last rebellion is crushed by fire from God. It's pictured here with this fire descending and it is the last rebellion and God puts that rebellion down. So you will notice the idea that each of us, when we come to die, that every individual human being stands in the presence of God, has his own private judgment day, that there are cosmic scales set up in which his good and his bad deeds are weighed to see where he will go, and whether he passes or fails, that test will determine where he will be. Just a simple reading of the passage shows you that is not the case. That when a person dies, he goes to either heaven or hell, awaiting a future day, if not saved, when he must meet the Lord Jesus. So this judgment is at the end of the thousand years. In other words, I can tell you tonight that what we are looking at is at least 1,007 years in the future. What it tells me is this. God determines when you're going to meet him. I have no idea when the Lord Jesus is coming back. To set these things in motion. I have no idea when this tribulation will start. I have no idea when the millennium will begin. I, I have no idea what the closing date of the millennium will be. I, I, I don't know that. I'm waiting for the Lord to come. See, God, that's all in God's hands. He'll determine when you will meet him. You will determine how. You will determine how. You will determine whether you meet him as a sinner to be condemned by the judge or whether you meet him as the Savior to be welcomed as his child home to heaven. But the timing of it is at the end of the millennial kingdom. Now, why does God allow this? Why, why, why does God allow this last rebellion to take place? Because he could, he could put it down before it even rises. Well, I think that there are some tremendously important lessons that we can learn from this. The first is this. Human nature, our nature, human nature is ruined. It's ruined. It's ruined as to the purpose for which it was made. You could go to a junkyard tonight, tomorrow, and you could be looking for a part. And you could tell the person what the car's year is and the model is and say, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm looking for a, a quarter panel. And it could be that the car that was wrecked was not damaging to the quarter panel. So it's not, you see, a write-off in the sense that there's no value to it. It's that it can no longer function for which it was made. It's not that you don't have any worth. It means that you can no longer function the way God made you. Sin ruined us as to the very purpose for which we were made. And nothing, absolutely nothing, but a new birth can fix us. Nothing. I didn't take the time to read it with you earlier in the meetings, but this period of time that we looked at very hastily, this great tribulation period, is the worst period of time in the history of the world. At your leisure, have a look at Revelation chapter 9, and twice over you'll read this, that in the midst of all of the misery and the, the, the judgments and the catastrophes that are inundating the world, twice over we read, yet they repented not, yet they repented not. In other words, in the worst period in the history of the world, all of those judgments couldn't change human nature. They refused to repent. But of course, the millennium, that's the greatest time in the history of the world. That's the golden age. And yet at the end of the best time, there are millions of people ready to try to murder Christ again. And in fact, we should understand that because the Lord Jesus tells us about heaven and hell. And he tells us about a man who died and went to hell. And the man in hell is not, he is not, 
saying he wishes he was in heaven. The man in hell is yelling at heaven that he wants heaven to do what he wants. It would be almost laughable if you weren't thinking of the surroundings that a man is in hell and he's yelling up at heaven, no, no, Father Abraham, no, not, not your way. Do it my way. You send somebody back from the dead. Because you see, even hell can't change a human nature. So when people say, why does a person have to go to the lake of fire forever? It's because God has only one way of changing a human being. And if you refuse that one way, there's no other way. There's no other option. You see, if a person dies in his sins, he remains a sinner forever. He will continue. She will continue to sin. And as long as a person is a sinner, without a new birth, the person cannot enter heaven. Because nothing can change us but being born again. Religion cannot change us. Baptism cannot change us. Faith cannot change us. Repentance in its own sense cannot change us. The only thing that can change a human being is to be born from above, to be born again by the power of God's gospel. Human nature is rebellious. We're determined to have our own way. The sin of Lucifer, the sin of Lucifer, who wanted to be like God, who wanted to be in charge, it was transplanted into human hearts, yours and mine, and it found fertile soil there to grow. So that you will hear this language that the Lord Jesus records in the New Testament about the attitude of people toward him. We will not have this man to reign over us. We will not have him. Crucify him. Give us Barabbas. Did you ever think of how illogical it all was? They brought the Lord Jesus to Pilate on trumped up charges. They, they, they knew they couldn't go to Pilate and, and claim that the Lord Jesus was against the Jewish law. So they trumped up charges and said that he claimed to be the son of God. He claimed to be a king. And therefore, he's a threat to Caesar. And he should be put to death. And they said, and we're good citizens. We have no king but Caesar. Right? Then what did they do? They turned around and they said... Release the man who rebelled against Caesar and killed people. We'll take him. People who said we have no king but Caesar chose a man who tried to overthrow Caesar. Because you see, it wouldn't matter whom Pilate put on that balcony that day and made the choice between the two. It would not matter because they wanted anybody else but Jesus. Because human nature is rebellious. The Lord Jesus said, you will not come to me that you might have life. If you're in the meeting tonight and you are not saved, I do not want to offend you. But I do want to tell you the truth. The reason you are not saved is because you have refused to come to Christ. That puts it squarely on your shoulders. My preaching may not be the best. It may, maybe the topic is not appealing to you. It may be, it, there may be all sorts of other reasons why you feel you're not saved yet. But the Bible says the reason you are not saved is that you will not come to Christ. You refuse to just take God's son and God's salvation in God's way. And do you remember how in Luke chapter 13, the Lord Jesus puts those two things in juxtaposition. And he tells us to enter in. And he says, how often... I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings and you would not. You would not. But of course, then he tells us, doesn't he, that a day is coming when the door will close and he will not. They say, Lord, Lord, open to us and he won't open the door. So just here tonight, you will understand the mistake you are making and failing to come to the Lord Jesus. So then what is the purpose? What's the reason for this? Why doesn't God just let everyone who is not saved die? Why set up this great white throne? First of all, it's going to show every human being who is not saved the reason for his condemnation. Every person who is not saved is going to see the record of her own sins, his own sins. And not one person will go into the lake of fire wondering why I can't be in heaven. 
it will mete out their punishment because as we'll note in just a few minutes, the judgment itself varies in punishment. And it will prove that no one goes to the lake of fire. No one goes to the lake of fire unless her name or his name is missing from the book. Because it's whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. There is a lot of discussion as to whether Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were actually guilty. They were executed as spies in the 1950s. And when they were condemned to death by the judge, their attorney sprang to his feet and said, Your Honor, I thought this court would have mercy. He, the, they were just condemned to die. At that point, it was the electric chair. And they were electrocuted. So their attorney leapt to his feet and said, Your Honor, I thought this court would show mercy. And the judge said, Sir, this is not a court of mercy. This is a court of justice. This is not a court of mercy. This is a court of justice. That is a court of justice. You want mercy? <laughs> it's flowing all around you. You want mercy? God will save you tonight no matter who you are, no matter what you've done. You want mercy? Let me tell you how rich his mercy is. He's rich in mercy. He will gladly, happily, joyfully save you tonight. What he prefers is to save you. If you want mercy, it's available now. Don't wait till then. Because that is not a court of mercy. That's a court of justice. And the reason will be so that men and women will know why they cannot be saved. Do you realize that as I'm speaking to you now, there are people in hell who have no idea why they're there. They have no idea why they're there. They don't know if they're in a, a temporary place of suffering, as their church told them, and that they will soon be released and everything will be all right. They don't know what took them there. They don't know how long they'll be there. They don't know why they're there. But no one will walk away from the great white throne still not understanding why she or he cannot be in heaven. And the participants. That's why I tried to stress for you. The rest of the dead didn't live till the thousand years were over. Do you remember when the Lord Jesus comes back as king? We read. There'll be two classes. And he'll separate them. Sheep and goats. But there's no separating taking place here. Separation taking place here. In Revelation 20. Because there's only one class. The rest of the dead. These are people who are not saved. And it's not that some are going away to the kingdom or to heaven and some are going away to the lake of fire. This is the, this is the sentencing of everyone who has never been born again. Who was on the throne? Well, John tells us, doesn't he? I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. But just a minute. The person sitting on that great white throne in that coming day is the man that we put on a cross. Because all judgment has been put into the hand of the Lord Jesus. Imagine people facing Christ. The Christ that they used, whose name they used when they cursed. Hit their thumb with the hammer and it's his name, right? Imagine having to stand before him. Who has the record of every one of your sins. So I need to hurry because I want you to notice the sentence. First of all. This is going to be powerful. This is something that dwarfs words, that defies description, that transcends terminology, that beggars language and leaves it in the dust. How can I describe to you the worlds passing away? A thousand, thousand graves being emptied when the Lord Jesus calls them out of their burial spots. The devil thrown into the lake of fire. This great white throne set up in space. The entire human race that is not saved standing before the Lord Jesus. If it was stunning when the Lord Jesus raised one man from the tomb after he had been dead for four days, what will it be like 
when the Genghis Khans, when the Attilas, when the Hitlers, when the Stalins and the Lenins? What will it be like when the mass murderers, what will it be like when people who died hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, they're all coming out to stand before the Lord Jesus? Because they'll all be there. The atheist, the agnostic, the Buddhist, and the Baptist. The religious sinner and the irreligious skeptic. Unconverted sons of Christians and unconverted sons and daughters of pagans. All standing there before God. Small and great. There'll be people who wielded scepters and wore crowns and commanded thousands. But they'll be trembling before the great white throne. This is going to be not only universal but personal. Because the idea is they were judged each one. Judged each one. And do you see what happens? That before this judgment, the devil is thrown into the lake of fire. Just imagine this vast throng that was incited to rebellion by the devil and were happy to join him and fight against Christ. Imagine what happens the moment that the deception is lifted. I will never forget reading Don Richardson's um, book, Lords of the Earth. And he talked about working among a tribe of uh, natives in Irian Jaya in Indonesia. And he said what added to the difficulty, if you've ever, if you read the condensed uh, version of his other book, uh, Peace Child in Reader's Digest, then you remember, he worked among people who glorified deception. It wasn't enough, you see, to kill your enemy. If you could trick him first and then kill him, well, now that was something. They glorified in it. So he had great trouble explaining to them that Judas was the villain until they realized that Judas had not deceived the Lord Jesus. But in his book, Lords of the Earth, he tells about a man. There were two tribes. They were warring against each other. And one of the natives is getting ready to leave that day. They, they, they lived in huts that were up on stilts. He's about to climb down, and his wife says to him, just to put it in English language, he said something along the line of, doesn't it make your skin crawl to go over to the other tribe? Like you're doing every day. No, oh, no, he said, they've, they've welcomed me, they received me. And he said, we're working on peace. He said, and, and this is the last visit, and then their elders are going to meet with our elders, and, and we're going to be at peace. So he climbed down. Got in his little skiff, headed down river, pulled in near the tribe. They were there to greet him, welcome him. Hail fellow, well met, pat him on the back. He climbed the ladder up into their hut. They all sat around. Food was being passed. See? He's dipping his hand in the bowl and eating. He's talking to the, the man he's been dealing with one, one on one. And the other elders of the tribe are all there. And he felt the silence. He had been dipping his hand in a bowl for some food. And when he looked up, spears were pointed at him. And on the other end of those spears, there were leering faces who had waited weeks for just that moment, just that moment when the blindfold would be stripped away and he'd realize, they tricked me. And he turned to the man he'd been dealing with and he said, help. And the man chewed a little more on his food and he said, I'm sorry. He said, I'd like to, but he said, he promised me his daughter in marriage and uh, sorry. Sorry. And I won't tell you how savagely he was killed. But they had worked and worked and worked for just the moment when the blindfold would be stripped off. Just the moment when the deception ended and he would realize, I was deceived. Now listen, the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. Do you realize what will happen? Do you realize that he has been deceiving the human race since Genesis chapter 3 and then all of a sudden... It will end 
and these people who were about to, to attack Jerusalem, as they stand before the great white throne, will realize what fools we were. Why did we listen to him? Let me ask you, why are you listening to him tonight? He's telling you that this isn't all that serious. You have plenty of time to, to think about this. Don't worry about it now. And Maybe it isn't all true anyway. Why are you listening to him? Because the devil that deceived them will be cast into the lake of fire. And they will stand each one before God. Now, can I tell you that God is not cruel? So whatever you think about the lake of fire, God does not torture people. Because God is not cruel. His judgment will be fair and righteous. It will be impartial. It strikes me this way that the Lord Jesus will not subject you to what we subjected him to. We had him face trumped up charges, lying witnesses, a kangaroo court, a prejudiced decision, predetermined before, before he even stood before the judges. But he tells us ahead of time what it will be like. First of all, books will be opened. Because there is a biography being written about you. And that biography is everything you've ever done. Everything you've ever thought. Everything you've ever said. It's the book of our works. What we've done in life. Our sins. My Sunday school class was in the corner of the gospel hall where I was a boy listening to the gospel. And there were folding doors there. And behind the folding doors in a room like that, but smaller, my parents and other Christians were having a Bible study. And then here in the main room, here and then in that corner, in that corner, there were Sunday school classes. And the wall at that time was just the ugly green. And I don't know how many times the Sunday school teacher would say something like this. Imagine if your sins just of one day were written on this wall here. And I used to think of those doors opening. And my parents walking out. And the Christians walking. And I, what was I, 10, 11? I hadn't murdered anybody. But I was a sinner. And I used to think of what it would be like to have to stand there with my sins all out in the open. How are you going to do it? When the searchlight of God's holiness shines on those books and into your soul and you have to stand and face every sin you've ever committed because a principle will be at work and it's called sowing and reaping. Whatever a person sows, he reaps. Jacob, Jacob fooled his father. Jacob's sons fooled him. Haman builds a gallow because he wants to hang that man. It ends up Haman being hanged on the gallows. There's a wicked Canaanite king called Adonai Bezek, who was lord over a town called Bezek. And when he would beat a king in battle, do you know what he would do? He would cut off their thumbs and he would cut off the big toe on both feet. So they couldn't walk and they couldn't war. See, he turned them into pet animals who would grovel for food in front of his throne. Do you know what happened when the Israelis came over the hill and attacked that town and defeated that man? They cut off his thumbs and they cut off his great toes. And he held up the bleeding stumps of his hands and he said, as, as I have done, God has paid me back. God has requited me. What happened? What he sowed, he reaped. Only trouble is you don't reap only what you sow. You reap far more than what you sow. And God says, if you sow a life of sin, you will reap an eternity without him. But then the Lord Jesus tells us that knowing and rejecting will come into play. He said it will be more tolerable for, for wicked pagan cities than for people who heard the gospel and turned from it. And there are no wicked pagans in the meeting tonight. But there are people who have heard the gospel. You've been prayed for. Somebody has likely talked to you personally, given you gospel papers, told you about the Lord Jesus. You see, if you miss salvation, 
your judgment will be worse. The Lord Jesus said the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment and condemn sinners who heard the gospel. She came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And the Lord Jesus said, here he was greater than Solomon. He said the men of Nineveh would rise up in the judgment. They had to listen to a preacher who didn't even care for them and didn't want them to be saved. Imagine that. Preaching to them and he really didn't even want them to be saved. He was upset when they listened to him and repented. But every Sunday when you hear the gospel here, if that's the case, you're listening to people who love you and want you to be saved. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment. And how awful and how final it will be to have to stand there and then be sent away into the lake of fire. Now, I am purposely not lingering on that awful thought because I just hope that the reality of it will reach you. And I want to spend the remaining time on how you can be saved from that coming judgment. Maybe the best or the easiest way would just be to apply it to myself in the hopes that you will apply it to yourself. And you know, that's how people get saved. Did you know that? That's how people get saved. They take things to themselves. They take the truth to themselves. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, I preach to you the very thing I took to myself. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day and he was seen of thousands of uh, hundreds of people. He said, I took that to myself. That's what happened on the, the Damascus Road. Ask Luke, and he'll tell you, well, there was this bright light, and Saul of Tarsus, later called Paul, he fell down, and he said, next thing you know, he, he, he's saying, who art thou, Lord? And I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest, is the answer. Paul says, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And it all seems so quick, doesn't it? Paul tells us what happened. When Christ called to him from heaven, he realized Christ was alive. Christ was in the glory of heaven. That's divine. That's God's glory. And he, he put the pieces together all of a sudden. I had been wrong all my life. He wasn't a blasphemer who died because of his sins. He died for mine. And, and, and if he's in heaven, then he rose again the third day. It's all true. What I've been fighting against and denying. And he took it to himself. Christ died for him. So I hope you'll take it to yourself when I tell you that I know I will never stand in the judgment because my judgment was endured at Calvary. My judgment, what I should have suffered, was endured at Calvary, at the cross. Listen to the words of the Lord Jesus. Now is a judgment of this world. Now. When he would be lifted up, God would judge the world by judging Christ. God would punish sin by punishing his son instead of you. Do you remember children in the Sunday school? They learn about David and Goliath. Two armies. Two armies. But one man comes out from this side. Towering hulk of a man. Goliath. Was he nine feet tall? Giant. He says, send somebody out from your side to fight with me. If he wins, we'll be your servants. If I win, you're our servants. So you see, not everybody had to fight. Goliath would represent them. David ended up representing them. At Calvary, the Lord Jesus represented me. You see, in the Garden of Eden, Adam represented me. You know what he did? He fell. He failed horribly. We, theologians call it the fall. They might as well call it the collapse, the crash. He dragged the whole world and his entire family into wreck and ruin. But at Calvary, the Lord Jesus represented me. He took my place. And God punished Jesus instead of me. You know, when I was first trying to preach, it was even worse than now. When I was first trying to preach, there were times when I said something like, Jesus endured my hell on the cross. You know what's wrong with that? It doesn't say enough. He didn't just endure my hell on the cross. He suffered infinitely. Infinitely. Not another person could ever suffer the way Christ suffered. 
You will think it's an exaggeration if I tell you that if you could somehow put together all of the grief and pain and suffering and sorrow that the human family has felt from Genesis 3 on till the end and add it together, if you could grasp all of the suffering of a soul in hell, if you could grasp all the sufferings of people in the lake of fire and somehow combine it, I tell you as God is my witness, he suffered more. He had an infinite capacity to suffer and he suffered infinitely. And the reason I will never suffer is because my sin was paid for by the Lord Jesus. And God's not going to demand payment twice. If he paid for my sins, God isn't going to make me pay for them. So my judgment was endured at Calvary. My safety was secured by the resurrection because the man who died for me rose again. And it is interesting to me that in Acts chapter 17, when Paul is preaching on a place in Greece called Mars Hill, he reminds people that the resurrection of Christ is the proof that there's going to be a judgment day. And he says, God raised the judge from the dead. And he's given witness to everybody. And he's commanding you to repent because he's appointed a day when he will judge the world in righteousness. And he's done it by the man he raised from the dead. We'll do it by the man he raised from the dead, the Lord Jesus. So the resurrection of Christ is the proof that judgment is coming. But the same man who preached in Acts 17 wrote to Christians in Romans chapter 4. And he tells them in Romans chapter 4 that the resurrection of Christ means they will never be brought into judgment. They will never be brought into judgment because Christ is alive from the dead. He has secured my safety. I know that what he paid at Calvary has satisfied God. And his resurrection is the miraculous receipt that God has a full payment for my sins. And finally, my exemption is assured by the word of God. My exemption from judgment is assured by the promise of the Savior in the word of God. What does he say? Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that hears my word and believes God that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment. So I know from this wonderful book that if the resurrection is God's miraculous receipt, this book is God's written guarantee. You know, there was a Chrysler some years ago used to have their slogan. If you can get a, if you can get a better guarantee, take it. Because they were offering you uh, the lifetime of your car, however long you owed your car. Imagine, how can you beat a lifelong warranty or guarantee? God beats it. Because he gives an eternal warranty or guarantee. Now, some of you are checking your watches and wondering when I'm going to stop. So I'll tell you what. I'm going to tell you one thing, and then you can go home. There was a young woman who used to live in Michigan here. She was a very close friend of my daughter Bethany's and of us, of the family. We were deeply concerned for her. I had preached many, many times to her and would not say that I detected much concern. But she came down to stay with us at a Pensacan conference one January. And I pulled my daughter aside and I said to her, something's up. She's just, she's acting differently. She seems so serious about just differently, see? So my daughter was actually going to go with me. I was going to Halifax, Nova Scotia for a week of meetings, ministry meetings, not gospel. And my daughter, who was off of college at the time, had a friend up there that she was going to go visit. That would be one of Peter Ramsey's daughters. And I said to Beth, well, what would you think if we invited her to go with us? I know there were ministry meetings, but what would you think, I said, if we invited her to go with us? She said, I'll mention it to her. So we did. She got in touch with where she was working, which was not really all that important. They said, fine. So she came with us. Long drive from New Jersey to Nova Scotia. And the Christians there, 
They welcomed her like she was an old friend, <laughs> right? Just threw their arms open wide. Wherever I was invited, they were invited. She came along and she sat for a week listening to Truth for Christians. And I just kept seeing a change taking place. And one day she needed, near the end of the week, she needed to go to the store, and I was the, the wheels. So I took her. She's sitting in the back seat. And when we got to the parking lot, I said, calling her by name, I said, I, I, I don't want to pressure you. But I said, is something going on? And it was like turning on a tap, right? She just burst out. She said, I just, I, I think I got saved. But she said, I don't know. How, how, how would I know? I'm not sure. I don't, I don't. So we never got to the store. We turned around, we went back to uh, Jana's apartment, got out the Bible, and she read what you read. She read what you read. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that hears my word, believes God that sent me, has everlasting life. And I said to her, now, those are three things Jesus joins together. And you can't separate them. See? See? He says that if you hear his truth and you accept that it's true, you have everlasting life. Now, now, you can hear and not accept it and not have everlasting life, but you can't hear it, accept that it's true, and not have everlasting life because he said it. She kind of scared me. You know what she did? She shut the Bible. She just, it was open there to John 5. She said, that's it. She said, that's exactly what happened to me. She said, there was no feelings. That's why I wondered. Maybe, I thought, maybe I'm missing something. But she said, I just saw, I just saw in the scriptures that, that he, he died for me and that if I would trust him, I'd be saved. But she said, I didn't feel anything. And I thought, that, that can't be salvation. But she said, that's it right there. She said, that's exactly what happened to me. That is exactly what happened to me. I was saved for about 45 seconds before I knew it. And I didn't feel a thing. When I was saved, I didn't feel a thing. And when I saw what it meant to be saved, the joy flooded my heart as I realized what had just happened to me. You see, it wasn't joy that told me I was saved. It was God. It was this wonderful book. And if you have heard his word tonight, that Christ died for the ungodly, and if you will accept that what God says is true, that he died for me, he says, you'll have everlasting life. You will not come into judgment. You have passed from death to life. Shall we pray?